Welcome to our channel. Today, we're diving into a serious and eye-opening topic, countries where Muslims are not welcome. We'll be exploring the significant restrictions and discrimination that Muslims face in various parts of the world. And trust me, some of these might surprise you. We're talking places you wouldn't expect, countries that like to pride themselves on their tolerance and open-mindedness, yet somehow seem to have missed the memo when it comes to their Muslim populations. So, buckle up as we uncover the harsh realities and social dynamics that Muslim communities encounter as minorities. Stay tuned. All right, let's start with a country known for its politeness and cultural richness, Japan. On the surface, it seems like a place where everyone would be welcomed with open arms and a polite bow. But for Muslims, the reality is a bit more complicated. See, Japan has a long history of homogeneity. They like things to be uniform, predictable, and for a long time, that worked for them. But in a globalized world, that kind of insularity can lead to, shall we say, a lack of understanding about other cultures. This manifests itself in subtle ways for Muslims. There's a significant lack of mosques, for example. Not because they're banned, mind you, but because the process of getting one built is about as easy as getting a cat to file your taxes. Then there's the social side of things. Next, we travel to Angola, a country on the southern coast of Africa, a place with a rich history and sadly a rather complicated relationship with religious freedom. Now, Angola's constitution technically guarantees freedom of religion. But here's the thing about constitutions. They're like user agreements. Everyone agrees to them, but no one actually reads the damn thing. And in Angola, the reality on the ground for Muslims is far from what's promised on paper. We're talking about a country where mosques have been shut down, sometimes even demolished, by the government. They justify this by saying these places of worship lack proper permits. But when other religious groups don't seem to have the same problem, you start to wonder if maybe, just maybe, there's a bit of selective enforcement going on. This creates a climate of fear and uncertainty for Muslims in Angola. Imagine not knowing if the place where you go to pray, to connect with your community, might be bulldozed tomorrow. It's a level of stress that no one should have to live with, and it's not just the physical spaces that are under threat. There have been reports of Muslims being harassed, discriminated against, even arrested for simply practicing their faith. Now let's hop over to Europe, shall we? France, the land of croissants, romance, and apparently a whole lot of opinions about what women should wear. France has this whole laïcité thing, which basically means secularism on steroids. The idea is to keep religion out of the public sphere, which sounds fine in theory, until you realize it's often used to target Muslims specifically. Exhibit A, the infamous burqa ban. In 2011, France became the first European country to ban face coverings in public, a move widely seen as targeting Muslim women who wear the niqab or burqa. France has also banned headscarves in schools, which, let's be honest, feels a bit like taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It's created a situation where Muslim girls are forced to choose between their faith and their education. Not exactly a recipe for a harmonious society, is it? Okay, folks, buckle up, because this next one is heavy. We're talking about China, specifically the treatment of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region. Now, China likes to keep a tight lid on information, but the stories coming out of Xinjiang are deeply disturbing, to say the least. We're talking about a systematic campaign of oppression against an entire population. Over a million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities are estimated to have been detained in what the Chinese government calls vocational training centers. But let's call a spade a spade. These are essentially concentration camps. Inside these camps, detainees are subjected to forced labor, political indoctrination, and even torture. They're forced to renounce their religion, pledge allegiance to the Communist Party, and basically abandon their cultural identity. It's cultural genocide, plain and simple. And it's not just happening within the camps. The Uyghurs who are still free face constant surveillance, religious restrictions, and economic marginalization. They're living in a real-life dystopian nightmare. Next, we turn to Myanmar, a country that's been making headlines for all the wrong reasons. 
You see, Myanmar has this group called the Rohingya Muslims, who have the unfortunate distinction of being considered one of the most persecuted minorities in the world. For decades, the Rohingya have faced systematic discrimination and violence at the hands of the Myanmar government and Buddhist nationalists. In 2017, the situation escalated to a whole new level of horror. The Myanmar military launched a brutal crackdown on the Rohingya, driving hundreds of thousands of them from their homes in what the UN has called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Those who managed to escape fled to neighboring Bangladesh, where they live in overcrowded refugee camps facing disease, poverty, and an uncertain future. Now, let's talk about India, the world's largest democracy. India has a long history of religious pluralism, but in recent years, there's been a disturbing rise in Hindu nationalism, which has led to increased discrimination and violence against Muslims. Since 2014, India has been governed by the Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, which has its roots in Hindu nationalist ideology. Under the BJP, there's been a concerted effort to marginalize Muslims and promote a Hindu-centric vision of India. This has manifested in a number of ways from discriminatory laws like the Citizenship Amendment Act, which fast-tracks citizenship for non-Muslim refugees, to the revocation of Article 370, which stripped the Muslim-majority state of Jammu and Kashmir of its autonomy. Beyond the legal changes, there's been a surge in hate speech and violence against Muslims. Mob lynchings, often fueled by rumors spread on social media, have become alarmingly common. Okay, back to Europe we go. This time to Switzerland, the land of chocolate, cheese, and apparently a surprising amount of anxiety about minarets. In 2009, the Swiss voted in a referendum to ban the construction of new minarets, those tall, slender towers that are often part of mosque architecture. Now, the Swiss government, they tried to argue against the ban, saying it was discriminatory and unnecessary. But the Swiss people, they had spoken. The proponents of the ban, they argued that minarets were a symbol of Islamization, a threat to Swiss culture. Which I mean, come on, it's a tower. Let's head north now to Denmark, a country known for its Huga lifestyle and progressive social policies. But even in this Scandinavian paradise, Muslims face their fair share of challenges. Denmark has some of the strictest immigration laws in Europe, and these laws have made it increasingly difficult for Muslims to immigrate to Denmark, even if they have family ties there. And for those who do manage to make it to Denmark, integration can be a challenge. There's a sense among some Danes that Muslim culture is incompatible with Danish values, and this has led to discrimination and prejudice. The Danish government has also implemented a number of controversial policies targeting Muslims, including a ban on face coverings in public, similar to the one in France. While Denmark may be a tolerant society in many ways, the situation for Muslims there highlights the challenges of integrating newcomers, particularly those from different religious backgrounds, into a society that prides itself on its homogeneity. Next stop, Italy, the land of pasta, pizza, and, well, a somewhat complicated relationship with Islam. Italy doesn't have a long history of Muslim immigration, and as a result, there's a lack of understanding and acceptance of Islam among some segments of Italian society. This manifests in a number of ways, from discrimination in housing and employment to verbal and physical harassment. Muslims in Italy often report feeling like second-class citizens, their contributions to society overlooked or dismissed. There's also a lack of adequate infrastructure for Muslims in Italy. Finally, we end our journey in Norway, another Scandinavian country known for its high standard of living and social welfare system. But for Muslims in Norway, the path to full integration can be a long and winding one. One of the biggest challenges facing Muslims in Norway is the perception that they're not fully integrated into society. This perception is often fueled by negative stereotypes and media portrayals, which can lead to discrimination and prejudice. There's also a sense among some Norwegians that Muslim culture is incompatible with Norwegian values, particularly when it comes to gender equality and freedom of expression. This has led to tensions between the Muslim community and the wider Norwegian society. Thank you for watching. We hope this video has shed light on the challenges faced by Muslims in these countries.
It's easy to look at these situations and feel overwhelmed, but it's important to remember that even small actions can make a difference. By spreading awareness, engaging in respectful dialogue, and challenging discrimination wherever we see it, we can create a more just and equitable world for everyone. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and stay tuned for our next video.